All right, welcome back. Uh, let's pick up from where we stopped. Before that, uh, any of you have any questions, any thoughts you'd like to share? Uh, feel free to share your thoughts, but if you don't have anything to share, uh, even as I'm teaching, uh, feel free to stop me, right? Uh, just feel free to stop me. Uh, maybe you can just unmute, ask your questions, or you can also post your questions on the chat and uh, try our best to answer it, right? Uh, OK, so let's continue from where we stopped. Uh, we stopped at the cross is the power of God's power of God and the wisdom of God. Uh, let's go into the whole purpose of incarnation. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Uh, maybe one of us can read that. It's on your notes. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. Would anyone like to read? Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Go ahead. Anyone can read. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Right. Thank you so much, Jack. Right, so Paul is writing here to the Philippians. He starts off with this verse. He's saying, let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus. What was that mind? Who being the form in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a bond servant. He was obedient to death, even death on a cross. So the whole purpose of Jesus, of, of the Father and, and, the, and the Son, Father sending the Son into this world, was a redemptive purpose. Jesus knew, right, uh, everywhere in his ministry, even as he ministered to the disciples, and uh, he kept telling them, hey, I'm not going to be around for long, right? Uh, he also said, you know, destroy this temple, and in three days he will build it again. So he knew, right? The one focus that Jesus lived his life was to complete what the Father who asked him to do that was to die on the cross right then what happened therefore god was nine therefore god also exalted him and gave him the name which was above every other name that in the name of jesus every knee shall bow every tongue shall confess right now the whole purpose of the incarnation the reason why jesus came to die on the cross was he was obedient to this death. And what does he expect of us as his children, as believers of Christ? What he expects is we be obedient to his word, to be obedient to preaching of the gospel, right? Uh, taking on the form of a born servant, being humble enough, right? Uh, so we see a lot of attributes here in this passage. He was humble. He took on the form of a born servant. He was, uh, you know, he, he he came in the likeness of man. Uh, and so God expects us to be obedient, not only in our personal life, but obedience in, in hearing the word, in preaching the word, right? Next point, from the foundation of the world, so the cross of Christ was not an afterthought. We've talked about this many times. It was God's plan if even before the foundations of the world. 
and there are many uh, scriptures there you can uh, take time to read that jesus foretold his crucifixion several times several times matthew 16 uh he uh, 16 21 to 23 from that time jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day then peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying far be it from you lord this shall happen to you but he turned and said to peter get behind me satan you are an offense to me for you are not mindful of the things of god but the things of men now poor peter uh, you know maybe he was surprised at uh, jesus's response get thee behind me satan you're calling me satan and maybe peter felt highly offended but here's the thing because jesus he was telling his disciples, hey, it's time we need to go to Jerusalem. Maybe the disciples are thinking, hey, why do you want to go to Jerusalem? They want to catch you. Last time you said before Abraham was, I am, they, they try to kill you there. Uh, and you know there's an assassin's threat on you. They may do anything to you. They may arrest you. They may kill you. They may... Why do you want to go back there? Let's go back to Judea. Let's go to Samaria. All of them love you there. But Jesus, uh, so that's why Peter says, no, no. God, this should not happen to you. Right? But Jesus immediately says, you are mindful of the things, not of the things of God, but the things of man. In the natural eye, Peter, you're looking at things that I should not die. But in the spiritual, it is already written that this should happen. And it's also written in the old covenant. Right? Matthew 20, 17 through 19. Now Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the twelve aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. Look at this. Jesus is not saying they may catch me. Listen, everyone, disciples, they may catch me. Right. So that time, you know, I don't know what they may do. Right? They may put me into prison. They may send me to Rome. No, no. Jesus knew exactly what is going to happen. They, when, when, when we go to Jerusalem, the Son of Man will be betrayed by the chief priests, the scribes. They will condemn him to death. They will deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge. That's what happened. The Romans did that. And to crucify. So Jesus knew that he was going to be crucified. And on the third day, he will rise again. Jesus foretold his crucifixion. It was not something that he was unprepared for. He was completely prepared for it. It was only at the Garden of Gethsemane when the weight of this, you know, of what he was going to do came upon him for a man who knew no sin to take up the sins of the entire world but he was obedient obedient to death even on a cross now it's not like the cross is there when jesus is saying oh man i wish there was another way out of this he's not saying that jesus was looking forward to the cross he was he purposed to go to the cross. Can you picture that? Who will purpose to go to be crucified? And the Romans, you know, were were masters in crucifixion. They know how to. They knew how to torture to the to the extent that many a times, uh, people who were going to be crucified died even before you know in a couple of minutes. Or some of them were not even crucified. They died before that. Right. But Jesus is saying, I, I, I need to go to the cross. Now, this is not just a cross with, the, you know, okay, just, you know, four, uh, two nails in the hand, one nail in the leg, uh, one crown of thorns. It's not about that. Yes, there is that physical aspect, the physical pain. But Jesus is saying, I have to go to the cross for the sins of the world. I have to make all things new. I have to fulfill what the prophecies have said, spoken of about me. 
Look at the many opportunities presented to Jesus to avoid the cross. Right? Here in Satan tempts Jesus, Matthew chapter 4, the entire temptation. Chapter 4, verse 8 through 10. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and, and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. What if Jesus succumbed to this temptation? Everything would have changed. Everything would have changed. But he said, no. And the, the, you know, you look at everything that is there. You know, Satan is showing him all the kingdoms of this world. It is all in the imagination. Wow. Maybe it, Jesus had one picture of him dying on the cross. I'm just giving an example, right? Maybe he thought about the cross. And here Satan is bringing this picture of him sitting on a throne with all the you know, kingdoms bowing down before him. And it was a temptation that the enemy brought, which looks better, the cross, death and blood and pain and torture, or a king sitting on a throne with all thousands and thousands of people bowing down before him. Of course, the second one looks better. But what does Jesus say? Away from me. Because the word says, you shall worship the Lord your God and only serve him. That is, you know, there were three temptations. I'm sure there were many more. But through temptation, um, there was a way for escape for Jesus. But thank God that he overcame. Two, through his disciples, Peter. Peter himself says, no, I will not let it happen. Right? And then he tries to cut off the soldiers here. Right? But Jesus, you know, stops Peter at his track and says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Three, at the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is praying, saying, God. Now, his will was weak. He says, God, let not my will, but your will be done. It was the, the thought of not about the physical, not about the pain that he's going to endure physically, but about tasting death, tasting sin, something that he has not created, something that was, you know, was not in his realm. He had to do it for us. All through the scriptures in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says he became sin so that the, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. At the Garden of Gethsemane. Right. You know, Matthew 26, 39, he says, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Again, a second time, he went, 26, 42, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me, unless I drink it, your will be done. He purposed to go to the cross. Right? So, what can we say from this? Jesus did not want to avoid the cross. He, he was gladly, you know, he gladly went to the cross because of us. He thought of us. How much more you and I must understand this and preach this Jesus who has been crucified. Preach it with all authority, understanding what he did for us. Right? The early church preached the cross of Jesus Christ. Look at this. The, the very first sermon in Acts chapter 2, the great uh, apostle Peter, uh, he, he preached right, uh, about, the, about the cross. He says, you know, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested by God to you by miracles, signs, and wonders, uh, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. 
him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put him to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that it, he should be held by it. The first sermon, the same Peter who said, no, I will not let you go to the cross. You should not die on the cross. Here in Acts 2, he's saying, men of Israel, the man who God attested for you, for signs, miracles and wonders, he purposed in, he, in his foreknowledge, he knew that this was going to happen. But God raised him from the dead. Right? Because death could not stop him. Death could not hold him in the grave. Right? Look at this. In Acts 4, Peter and John went to pray in the temple. They saw a lame man. Right? And what does he do? Before, you know, he, he just goes on to say, verse 4 and 11, the stone which was rejected by you builders, which became now has become the chief cornerstone. Now there is salvation in nor there is salvation in any other, for there is no other name under he heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now I'm just picturing it, right? Uh, one of the things I always do as I read the scriptures is to picture and to imagine what is happening. That is where it you know it really builds a sense to what we are reading. Uh, let picture this. Acts, Jesus is dead and gone, resurrected. He's commissioned the disciples. Now there are only probably 150 people there who are filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And now you've got the disciples, Peter and John, full on fire for God. They have seen in Acts 2, thousands of people believing in Jesus, and now they are on fire for God. There is no, not an ounce of fear. They're going into the temple, right, to pray. The, this is the main temple. They have gone there maybe thousands of times. They have probably seen this lame man hundreds of times. But what has changed here? The first verse itself, 4.8. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. And the story goes on, right? He heals. Silver and gold have I not, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Even when they healed the lame man, right? Peter and John took it as an opportunity. They didn't heal and run away. Oh, don't tell anyone about Jesus. Actually, he's alive. We met him on the road to, he, he met a few of our friends on the road to Emmaus. We met him uh, in, our, uh, you know, our, in our friend's home. Uh, we've seen him. We saw the holes in his hand. We, we spoke to him. We had breakfast with him one day. Uh, but don't tell anybody. Keep it to yourself. Is that what happened? No. They were bold and strong. They, they preached the gospel in all boldness. Now they preach in such wisdom that later on the Pharisees and the uh, you know the learned teachers of the law came and said, how, how, how do these people know? Where did they get their wisdom from? These unschooled fishermen who we've seen walking around here so many times. So how are they speaking with such authority? Why? Because God had commissioned them. They were preaching not in their own intellect. They were preaching the gospel, the message of the cross, and they saw the power of God. Imagine Peter's walking there, and it's sunny, a sunny morning, and hey, Peter's walking, let's bring all the sick people and line them up. So we put all the sick people there, and Peter's walking, and a shadow begins to heal people. So you just picture those things, right? How? Because of the message of the cross. It's not about Peter, it's the cross they preached. And God, when we preach the cross, God begins to approve of it through signs, wonders, and miracles. Next one, the first sermon to the Gentiles. Acts 10, about 15 years later, they've been ministering only to the Jews. Acts 10 onwards, how God appointed, he's, he's talking to uh, the Gentiles here. 
how God appointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, right? And he gives that whole the whole gospel. God raised him on the third day and showed him openly, not only to people, but to witnesses chosen before God. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he was he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. See, uh, even to the Gentiles, now we don't see an ounce of fear. Right? We don't see the disciples saying, okay, uh, I know that you don't believe in Jesus. I know you'll believe in maybe the sun or the moon and uh, you have uh, idols that you worship. So if you'd like to continue, you continue with that. But I want to tell you about this man named Jesus. No. There was no compromise. It was straight, straight to the gospel, straight to the message of the cross. And what happened after that? He prays on them, Cornelius and family, the first Gentiles to receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Right? So, and finally, Paul on his missionary, first missionary journey, when Paul went, what did he say to the, uh, he went into Galatia. Now, Galatia has five churches. Uh, let me see if I can get them right. Iconium, Lystra, Derby, uh, the Pisidian Antioch, uh, Iconium, Galatia, or Fergia, right? So those five churches in Galatia. Uh, so Paul goes into those churches, go, goes into Galatia, begins to preach, plants churches in Galatia. Now, what happens? He's preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've all believed in Jesus. They believed in the message. Some are Jews, some are Gentiles, mixed crowd. They're coming to church. After the first missionary journey, Paul gets to know they're going back to circumcision. And some of them are involved in, uh, you know, uh, all these practices that they were involved in when they were uh, Gentiles. So Paul is angry. Right? But what did he do? He preached the gospel to start, start with. And it's everywhere, not only his first missionary journey, everywhere. He preached the message of the cross, right? So the message of the cross is the main message of the church. If we are not preaching the message of the cross, we are not preaching the gospel. Right? Remember, some of us may become pastors and you know, great worship leaders and prophets and evangelists. It's wonderful, right? God calls us for these wonderful callings that he has set in place. But remember that in all of this, more than the title, if we are not sharing the message of the cross, we are not sharing the gospel at all. We're just good speakers or we're just wasting our time thinking about, you know, uh, thinking that we are building God's kingdom, but we really aren't. Right? Remember this, preach the gospel. Because that simple gospel is the power of Simple gospel. You don't have to add too much to it. You don't have to remove it. And we talked about it in living uh, lifestyle evangelism, right? I think it's very simple. If you believe it, you'll be able to share with that same belief. You can only give what you believe in. If I don't believe in something, I cannot give it. Okay? Uh, very simple. If I don't believe praying is important, I cannot tell you to pray. If I don't believe worship and spending time meditating in God's word is important, I cannot tell you to do it. Even if I tell you, it's not going to be very effective because I myself am not doing it. Right? So it is very important to understand that the message, the gospel, the message of the cross is a very simple thing. Right now we have complicated it. Right. But it's good. It's good that we have all these wonderful resources. We have these commentaries and, uh, you know, uh, Greek and Greek study, Hebrew study, learning about cultures and, uh, you know, you know uh, the culture back then, the geographical uh, uh, settings and all these things are very important. It helps us. But these are all catalysts 
to point to the message of the cross. Right. So if we're talking about, for example, I, I remember hearing a wonderful sermon. Um, uh, I think the sermon was from John Piper, and it's a wonderful, powerful sermon. Right. He talks about. Um, I forget the name of the sermon, uh, but I heard listening to it. He's talking all, all about the Persians, why the Persians came up with crucifixion. How did they come up with this whole idea of uh, crucifixion? And how the Persians, uh, you know, how the Romans adapted this Persian, uh, you know, uh, way of uh, torture. And how the Romans added things to that. Uh, the Persians had a certain way of crucifixion, but Romans, they mastered it. They added pain to it. And they're talking about crucifixion and uh, you know uh, the, the the signs of crucifixion. What happens to our body? Uh, you know. So this whole message was you know he was talking about this and now what do the Romans normally do during crucifixions? How they break the person's bones and all these things, right? Um, but in the end, right, and so beautifully he brings it down in line to what Jesus did. Right. Uh, basically, Jesus died of a cardiac arrest or heart, uh, his heart. Uh, there, there's no blood pumping to his heart. So in science, scientifically, he died of a cardiac arrest. Right? Uh, but, you know, a cardiac arrest is very painful, very, very painful. Every breath he took, every inhale that he took, it would make it even more difficult for the exhaling. Right? So it was, it was such a painful death. And he explains all of it and he says he did and towards the end of the sermon he just points out and he says he did it for you he did it for me but that's not the end of the story he pulls out the book of romans and he says who can separate us from the love of christ neither life nor death nor angels nor demons nor principalities nor powers of darkness can separate us from the love of christ praying the gospel in was this message good? He was talking all about history and the practical things that were involved. But he pointed to Jesus Christ at the end. It's not so powerful. It really touches people's lives. So even as you you know prepare for sermons, you prepare to lead the worship, point people, lead people to the cross, lead people to his this wonderful place where it is a place of victory. Don't be ashamed of the cross. And it's not about wearing the cross. Whether you want to wear one, you don't want to wear one, it doesn't really matter. And now it's become a, a, a style quotient, right? People wear the cross, they get tattooed the cross, they have no idea what the cross is all about. Uh, nobody gets impressed with all that, right? The Lord is not impressed with that. You can have a silver cross, a gold cross, good. But if we know the meaning of it, then the enemy is afraid. Then the enemy knows, oh, this boy or this girl, or this man, this woman knows the cross, knows what you know Jesus did on the cross. And that's powerful, right? So I want to encourage each one of you, even as you begin your ministries, you know, you're studying here, focus on the cross. In times of failures, in times of challenges where you feel weak, where you feel unloved, you feel uh, just, you know, discouraged in life, you get a cross. Remember, he paid the price for you, for everything, for your emotions, uh, your, for your mind, for your body, for your future. Everything was paid for on the cross. Right? So don't let the enemy uh, bring you down just because, you know, uh, we're going through seasons in life. Pick up. Pick up, fall down, pick up, stand up again, fight the good fight of faith, right? So that's wonderful that each one of us has this opportunity. None of us can say, no, I, I'm only, you know, setting up chairs in the church. No. Set up chairs, sit in one of those chairs and ask God to minister through you. Right? You can do it. Right? You may be doing sound and set up. Preach the gospel. You can. Right? Okay, so let's get into chapter nine. Uh, any questions? Any thoughts? Anyone know? 
awfully quiet. Everyone at least following? Uh, are you following what we're teaching? Is it okay? Uh, you can say yes, no, give a thumbs up. Are you able to track along? Uh, am I going too fast? Everyone okay? No questions? Okay. All right. Let's go to chapter nine. Chapter nine, we'll quickly do this and see if we can uh, finish this and then pick up from chapter 10 from next class onwards. Okay. Chapter nine, the shadows of the cross. Now, you may have gone through a few of these points uh, uh, in Christology, I'm not sure if you may you know done it already, but let's look at a few shadows of the cross. I, I think last week we also talked about a few. We just touched base on this, uh, but the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ and the work of the cross in many different ways. Right? Uh, let's look at Luke 24, 25 to 27, and 44 to 47. Can one of us read this, please? It's on your notes. Anyone can read. Sean, if you're there, can you read? Luke 24, 25 to 27, and 44 through 47. So he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might confront the scripture. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that he repents and remissions, remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning to add Jerusalem. Right. Thank you, Vibhav. Right. Now, this encounter happened when Jesus died, and now he's on the road to Emmaus. Uh, we know the story, right? These two people are talking. Hey, have you heard of uh, you know what happened? You know they they supposedly crucified the Messiah uh, right here on this mountain. Um, well, what's happening of him? Uh, I wonder what the, his followers are doing right now. And these two are discussing. He was a good man. He did mighty miracles. He healed the blind. Healed the sick. Uh, he uh, he spoke powerfully. He boldly spoke against the Pharisees. Maybe they were discussing. And then Jesus joins them. And then he begins to uh, expound to them the truth. He says, verse 27, And the beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures and the things concerning himself that was written in the law of Moses and the Psalms concerning me. Uh, the Psalms has plenty of, uh, you know, in detail. There are some verses, in, uh, I forget the, maybe next week we, we, we can look at it. Uh, uh, some of the uh, Psalms which says, uh, you know, uh, they, they put a crown of thorns on his head. It's so much in detail. Right? Uh, they led him like a lamb. He was, uh, he went up. Uh, like a lamb led to the slaughter, he went. Right? Uh, and so the Lord Jesus expounded the scriptures. There are plenty of places in the Old Testament. He expounded to them. Now, Jesus didn't do, you know, it's so interesting. No? Jesus is so much of wisdom and so much that we can learn. Jesus didn't say, hey, you two, what are you talking about? No, we're talking about Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. Okay, that's me only. 
So that's me. See, look at this hole in my hand. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, you see, I'll show you my bruises. That's me only. They would have got scared and ran away, thinking it's a ghost. Because they see, they know that Jesus was crucified. But look at the wisdom that Jesus walked in. He went, he joined them. Shani, what are you all talking about? Talking about the person who supposedly said he is the Messiah, he was crucified. Okay. So let me tell you something. The scriptures say about this crucifixion. See, this is the what scripture says. If there was chapter and verse, maybe he would have quoted it. There was no chapter and verse that time, but uh, he would have quoted it. He said, see, this is what Isaiah is saying. This is what the law of Moses is saying. This is what the psalmist is saying. King and David wrote about me. Abraham wrote about me. And these are the people who have written about me, written about the crucifixion. And the more he was speaking to them, the more these two, their hearts were burning. I said, hey, don't go. Come and have food with us. And the more, and we know the end of the story, he, he began to expound and expound the word. And suddenly their eyes were open and they realized that he was the Messiah. How did it happen? Through the word. All that the Lord Jesus did was expounded the word of God. And Jesus didn't go to prove himself. He proved himself through the word of God. Right? To the disciples, he proved himself. Right? You see the wisdom? So wonderful, right? To these two, he proved himself through the word of God. To the disciples, he proved himself. He said, Thomas, come touch. Flesh and blood don't have... Uh, I'm, a, I'm not a ghost. I'm, a, I'm flesh and blood. I'm not a spirit. I'm here. You come and touch, touch my side, Thomas. I'm alive. But he's proving himself. So, what is this? What does it teach us? As children of God, point to the word of God. It's a, it's a good foundation to stand on. And even when we talked about the temptation, what did Jesus do? He used the word of God. Here, again, Jesus using the word of God to, to you know, bring revelation to these two people. They were discovered. Were not our hearts burning when he was speaking? Yes, it was. And he was able to uh, reveal to them that it was all written in the Old Testament that now fulfilled in the New. The seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he will bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. 4,000 years before. What, whatever Jesus did, he did for you and me. Jesus crushed the head of the serpent so that you and I can crush him under our feet. Romans 16, 19, and 20. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Wonderful, right? The seed of the woman. The moment Adam and Eve sinned, God said that the seed of the woman, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he will bruise your head. And you shall bruise his heel. Look at that. 4,000 years before. Why did God wait 4,000 years? That's according to his calendar. That's according to his time. Nobody can prove it. He wanted to wait, so he waited. But it was all there in the Old Testament. The shadow of the cross. The first clothing. We talked about the blood covenant. right? And Adam and his wife, the Lord God, made tunics of skin and clothed them. Right now, suddenly they realized, hey, I'm naked. So they were covering themselves with leaves and all of that. right? And now, uh, after covering themselves, God, God comes, walks in that garden casually and asks them, how do you know you were naked? Uh, we ate, did you eat of the fruit, the forbidden fruit that I told you not to eat of? Oh, yes, we ate. Eve told, it's tasty. Okay. Now you've done this. Now, 
I need to cover your sins for now. What will I do? The Lord Jesus, God himself, killed an animal by the shedding of blood and covered them with, this, with the skin of that animal. There was a blood covenant made that time. You know, you look at the cross, it's a replica, replica of what happened here. Look at Cain and Abel. Uh, Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock, verse four, Genesis 4, 4 and 5. Uh, sorry, verse 3 and 3 to 5, let's read. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit to the ground, of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected, or the other versions say, was pleased, respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Worship that will be accepted by God must come based out of shedding of blood. A worship of God cannot be based on human effort. So, you know, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and though it he being dead, still speaks. Remember later on what happens? Cain, where are you? I'm here. Okay. You see how casual it is, God speaking to his people. Cain, where are you? Yeah, I'm here, God. Where is your brother Abel? I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. You must know he's God. You're God. And here's the thing. How can you tell God I don't know? He can't tell God I don't know because God knows. What did God say? The blood of your brother is still crying out to me. The blood that you shed. You killed your brother. That blood is crying out to me. The blood of the innocent Abel is crying out to me. This blood is, is, is a typology or a type of the blood that Jesus shed. Innocent blood shed on the cross. Right? Abraham and his sacrifice, this we've talked about a lot. Abraham takes uh, uh, Isaac on that mountain and then the whole story ends with the ram that was stuck in the thickets by its horns. Uh, God tells Abraham, take it and cut it and make that as a sacrifice. The same way the Lord Jesus uh, was on the mountain and this time he shed his blood uh, for the sins of this world and we talked about it a lot. And then we looked at the Passover lamb as well, right? How the blood that was put on the doorposts of the people of Israel, death passed by. The same way, uh, when we believe in the blood of Jesus, when we cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus, we are covering ourselves. We are protected by the works of the devil. We are covered and the enemy has no entrance, no access. Right? First Corinthians 5, 7, therefore, Purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly, you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Christ is our Passover lamb. Everything the Passover lamb, everything that God told Moses to do in the old covenant, is a type that Christ brings into reality into our lives. Everything. Moses may have never thought of it. Or why should I why should I put the bronze pole? Where do I go find a bronze pole now to kill a snake tied up there? Okay, since you're saying I'll do it. But he didn't realize that it is type that's going to happen in the future. The rock that was struck once. Now we know the story of this one, right? Uh, God tells Moses, strike the rock. People are complaining, there's no water, there's no food. Strike the rock, water came flowing out of the rock. Second time, God says, speak to the rock. He got into the habit, Moses hit the rock. And because of this one mistake, he didn't get to go into the promised land. One mistake. Why? Because 
it was a type the rock was jesus right he was struck only once and after that he can uh, you and i can you know really begin to uh, talk to him rather than uh, you know he he's not it's, it's just a one sacrifice once for all right next levitical sacrifice okay we talked about all of this the burnt offering the sin offering trespass offering peace offering all these offerings uh, spoke of what christ did for us on the cross right? the day of atonement christ became both our sin offering and our sin bearer now uh Okay, maybe we'll stop here. The Day of Atonement. It's very interesting to you know study a little in detail. I'll just give you what the Day of Atonement is, uh, what they would do uh, on this Day of Atonement. Uh, so, uh, would they would take two lambs, and you know it's wonderful. So we'll we'll try to spend some time on this next class. So we'll stop here, um, and we'll pick up from uh, from here in the next week. Right. Uh, let's quickly close in prayer. Uh, before that, any questions? I know I feel been very quiet, but uh, if there are questions, you can make a note of them, and we'll take some time to answer them next class. Uh, so let's close in prayer. One of us can uh, close in prayer, please. Any one of us. Go ahead. Anyone. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for guiding us now here for this class, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for under again, new understanding, new wisdom, Heavenly Father, about your word, Heavenly Father. And thank you for speaking to Paul, sir, Heavenly Father. Please guide me to more knowledge to come, Heavenly Father. And please help us to grow more in your wisdom of this, whatever we really understand, Heavenly Father. Please help us better, Heavenly Father. And thank you once again for bringing us all here to listen to your word today, Heavenly Father. And learn about the father in Jesus' name, pray. Amen. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a great week ahead. See you next Thursday. God bless.